Be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Jesus Christ, our Lord, you are almighty and have power over the universe. To the crowd pressing upon you, you said, Power has gone out from me. Then to the hemorrhaging woman who was healed by touching the fringe of your clothes, you said, O oh, daughter, your faith has made you whole, go in peace. Now we ask you to heal us from every sin, that we may stand with purity before you all the days of our lives. We raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the Father who had compassion on all people and sent his only begotten Son to save them. To the only begotten Son who bandaged their wounds and poured healing ointment upon them. And to the life-giving Holy Spirit who sanctifies those who take refuge in him. To the good one be glory and honor on this blessed Sunday and all the days of our lives and forever. All-powerful and almighty Father, long ago you spoke to our ancestors in various ways, but at the appointed time you sent your beloved Son to us. Through his words and miracles he taught us about you and commanded us to love one another. We thank you for all that you have given us through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We glorify you, O Father, the Lord of life and salvation. You are the Holy One who knows what life lies within the hearts of those who love you, and you heal all the pains of those who take refuge in you. As your only begotten Son healed the paralytic and the blind man, the hemorrhaging woman and the lame man, heal us and fill our souls with calm and peace. As your Son calmed the surging waves, now, O Lord, we implore you with the fragrance of this incense for all those who are suffering. Pour the balm of your consolation on their wounded hearts. Watch over them with your fatherly eye, lest in their trials and suffering they stray far from your love. Raise your right hand and bless also those who are healthy, so that joy may dwell within the hearts of all. We raise glory and praise to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit forever.
O oh, physician, lover of all people, we thank you for your compassion, for you have bandaged the wounds of our suffering humanity. Heal the sick and comfort the sorrowful. Accept our prayers as you accepted the plea of the hemorrhaging woman. Bless our community that prays to you. We believe that you are our Savior and Redeemer, and we await the day of your glorious resurrection. To you be glory and thanks forever. Kadisha Taloho Kadisha Hayel Tono Kadisha Loho Yukoto and touched his cloak all on earth be attentive she was cured and made it known from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. Brothers and sisters, I have great confidence in you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with encouragement. I am overflowing with joy all the more because of our affliction. For even when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were afflicted in every way, external conflicts, internal fears. But God, who encourages the downcast, encourage us by his arrival of Titus, and not only by his arrival, but also by the encouragement with which he was encouraged. In regard to you, as he told us of your yearning, your lament, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. For even if I saddened you by my letter, I do not regret it. And if I did regret it, for you see that letter saddened you if only for a while, I rejoice now, not because you are saddened, but because you were saddened into repentance, for you were saddened in a godly way, so that you did not suffer loss in anything because of us. For godly sorrow produces a salutary repentance without regret, but worldly sorrow produces death. 
For behold, what earnestness this godly sorrow has produced for you, as well as readiness for a defense, and indignation, and indignation, and fear, and yearning, and zeal, and punishment. In every way you have shown yourself to be innocent in the matter. Praise be to God always. Let the free people praise you, O God. Let all people praise you. Praise, glory, and honor of the Most of the Trinity. For in this instance, Kyrie Eversum. Before the proclamation of the Gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke, who proclaimed life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. Remain silent, O listeners, for the Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen and give glory and thanks to the word of the living God. The evangelist Luke writes, when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they had been waiting for him. And a man named Jairus, an official of the synagogue, he came forward. And he fell at the feet of Jesus, and he begged him to come to his home, because he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, and she was dying. As he went, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman afflicted with hemorrhages for 12 years, who had spent her whole livelihood on doctors and was unable to be cured by anyone, came up behind him and touched the tassel on his cloak. And immediately her bleeding stopped. Jesus then asked, who has touched me? While all were denying it, Peter said to him, Rabbi, the crowds are pushing and pressing in on all sides upon you. But Jesus said, Someone has touched me, for I know that power has gone out from me. When the woman realized that she could not escape notice, she came forward trembling and falling down before him, she explained in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been healed immediately. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. And while he was still speaking, someone from the synagogue's official's house arrived and said, Your daughter has died. Do not trouble the rabbi any longer. Upon hearing this, Jesus himself answered, Do not be afraid. Just have faith, and she shall be saved. When he arrived at the house, he allowed no one to enter in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Everyone was weeping and mourning for the child. When he said, Do not weep any longer, for she is not dead, but sleeping. And they mocked and they ridiculed him, 
because they knew that she had died. But he took the child by the hand and called to her, Child, arise. Her breath returned and she immediately arose. He then directed that she should be given something to eat. Her parents were astounded, but he instructed them to tell no one what had happened. This is the truth, peace be with you. Praise and blessings to Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, for giving us his words of life. Praise and blessings to Jesus Christ, our Lord and God. I have great confidence in you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with encouragement, and I am overflowing with joy all the more because of all our affliction. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. There is a central theme that runs through this day of sorrow. Sorrow with the hemorrhaging woman in the gospel. Sorrow in this epistle today. And sorrow being the commemoration of St. Patrick in his enslavement. So sorrow and sadness are not exactly the same thing. St. Paul, Paul is referring several times to sorrow in his epistle today, in the second letter to the Corinthians. Sadness is when something bad happens to us, but it's accepted. It's like grief. Someone dies. We can't bring them back. And it may be a sadness that will carry the rest of our lives, but we accept it. It's part of what takes place on this earth. Then there are other things which happen, which are bad, which we call bad, but we don't accept could be health, loss of a job, betrayal by a colleague. It could be all kinds of things. And we don't really accept that it's happening in our life, and it causes distress. That is, sorrow is a deep distress with this caused by loss. Something that happens in our lives. A disappointment either for us, a misfortune, a loss for ourselves or for others. And so St. Paul comes back to this idea of sorrow, and it's just the three points that I wanted to mention to you on the hemorrhaging woman in this letter. We'll come back to the letter in a moment, St. Patrick. Is note in this gospel that this woman, by God's providence, has been allowed to be sick for what, over a decade, 12 years, we're told. And not only 12 years, but St. Luke, remember that he's educated as a physician, he includes in his gospel that the poor woman not only has been sick for all of this time, having this problem of her blood flow, but also the fact that she spent all of her money on physicians and no one's helped her at all. So she's also been impoverished by this. But there's a third point that every Jew would have known there is that she's also, by the law of Moses, unclean. She's not allowed to be out with other people because of this blood flow. She's not allowed to go to the temple because she's considered polluted by the ritual of the law of Moses. So there's a lot of weight upon this woman. We have no idea what her name is. We have no idea where she comes from. We're assuming that she's Jewish, but we're not even told that. But we do know this it would be an enormous burden to carry an illness for over a decade like this continually. And God allowed this for this example of healing to take place. Remember that we're presented on these Sundays of Lent with these miracles of healing in order to inspire us and encourage us in this refuge of our Lord to be healed. You notice in the prayer in the Husoyo today 
that we ask for the grace for healing for all those who take refuge in our Lord. It's a very simple idea, but it's one that we don't necessarily always think about. So this woman, in fact, is, her health is lost for all of these years. And the humiliation that comes by the law of Moses, that she's not even supposed to have any contact with people around her because she's polluting. And she's also lost all of her money. And yet, for the last 2,000 years, we speak of this woman. Because she's an epitome not only of faith that she had to have, but also in her sorrow, desperation. If I can only touch the fringe off the bottom of this man's cloak, this rabbi, I will be healed. She doesn't say, perhaps I will be. Her faith is such that all I have to do is get close enough. So she's pushing herself through this rabble of people who are crushing on our Lord. So there is a great sorrow that leads up to her healing. Sorrow is not necessarily something which is defeating, we should say. And St. Paul makes a distinction in this letter of godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. But they're not the same. <clears throat> and of course, being today St. Patrick, we all know green beer, that's not the problem. <clears throat> Excuse me. But of course, there are two things I'd like to note about St. Patrick, is that he's a contemporary with St. Marin. And it's a fascinating thing. St. Marin is probably about 25, 30 years older than St. Patrick. And they are at opposite ends of the empire. Marin is at the furthest edge off in the, in the Middle East. And St. Patrick is probably from an area that we call Wales now. But of course, he goes outside the boundaries of the empire because at the age of 16, he's dragged off in slavery. Patrick belongs to basically what we'd call a middle-class family. His father is kind of a middle-ranking middle, middle ranking official within the Roman Empire. And probably about 385, he's born. So about the year 400, these barbarians and wild men from the neighboring island of Ireland, they lead raids. You steal things, the Vikings do this later. This has been a long-term historical career for people. Ransacking, stealing, raping, and taking off slaves. And so the pagan Irish do this, and they come along the western coast of the British Isles, and it happens that Patrick is in the wrong place at the wrong time, and he's dragged away at the age of 16 after having lived in a Roman life. Off to a very, very wild island of wild people, worshiping gods who are very violent. You know the Celtic mythology is that it's violence. And you have the idea that the bravado of the Irish about death and all you know, these warrior culture is because actually they had a great fear of death and the gods themselves oozed the death. It's very much part. Their houses are de decorated in the common houses with skulls stuck in the posts of the doorways. And Patrick, coming from this Roman culture, is dragged off into it. And he's t he tells us in this autobiography of the six years of his slavery that he was often very, very hungry and naked. He was just given the bare minimum to survive and he was sent off by the chieftain who owned him to be a shepherd. As a shepherd, he just by himself, just left out there with these animals. And he's a typical 16, 17 year old Religion's not a big deal. Of course, at 17, I'm still immortal. I'm never going to die. Nothing's going wrong. Everything's an adventure. But when you're half naked and starving out on the hillsides of the fields shepherding animals, Patrick begins to pray. So that what happens is his loss of freedom his loss of his family, this profound sorrow of being dragged off becomes the beginning of this young man's conversion. 
Conversion not in the sense of being baptized, but conversion that we are all on a path of, of turning more and more faithfully towards the Lord. We almost have the impression in his autobiography, if he hadn't been dragged off in slavery, would we ever have heard the man's name? Taken over his, his dad's job, lived a more or less comfortable life, died in obscurity, and who knows if he would have saved his soul. But this sorrow, this loss of freedom, took him off into captivity, and he was given six years to be there on the sides of these hills, shepherding, half naked, half starving, but praying. It's a tremendous lesson for us. And then we know that we're told, he says that in one of the, his nights, a voice woke him and said, your ship is ready to go leave. Well, he isn't anywhere near the shore. And he starts to walk. And he basically walks across most of the island and finds a ship and winds up leaving, going back to the continent. And while he's on the continent, has again his second famous dream, which is of an Irishman appearing and saying, we need you to come back. And that's the beginning, the initiation. He goes back about the year 430 to these wild people, these savage, death-embracing warrior culture people. And he spends the next 30 years, 40 years of his life there bringing the gospel. And it said, well, how do these people actually receive him? There were some Christians living in the area, not many. Is that Patrick, because of his trust in the Lord God, never showed them that he was afraid of them. And that piece of the gospel that he brought, and the fact that he was courageous, he was not afraid of these naked, aboriginal, wild men and women, because the women were just kind of as murderous as the men in Irish culture that they were taken by that peace and drawn to it. Remember, people who may have embraced death externally, but who internally, psychologically, seem to have a great fear of it. And he brought them something which was the light and the healing of the gospel. Roman civilization had never touched Ireland. But because he was forced into the six years of slavery, it disposed him and transformed him as a young man, which brought life to an entire continent and now to tens of millions of descendants. Now we say this because in the 20th century, the Lebanese very much imitate what the Irish were doing in the, in the 19th century, which is leaving their country. And now the Irish have whatever, there are 8 million people living in the country, back on the island, and 50 million people living in the diaspora. Many of them, thanks be to God, are still Catholics, not as many as should be. But the faith has also continued with them because of what one man did back in the early 400s. But at the same time that Patrick is bringing order into chaos on this island through the gospel, Marin is bringing the gospel. Of course, St. Patrick isn't even in the Roman Empire when he's in Ireland. St. Marin is always living within the boundaries of the political Roman Empire. But as he's bringing peace and order through the gospel to Ireland, Patrick is fortifying a group of ascetics. Excuse me. Marin is fortifying a group of ascetics who are going to be a stability, a point of peace, as the country around them devolves into chaos throughout the 400s. And all of the fighting over the councils and the confusion over religion, because of course, those churches had been there for the last, some of them, 300 years. Patrick's bringing the gospel for the first time to these people. But the churches, and some of them being three centuries old already in the Middle East, they're going to devolve into chaos. And that buffeting of the chaos and the loss of unity and all of this misunderstanding and rebuke and schism, in the middle of it will be this group of ascetics, men and women, and the laity who come around them forming this unified place of orthodoxy and peace. 
And that is Beit Marun. It is a contemporary movement happening at the edge of the eastern part of the Roman Empire simultaneously while Patrick is trying to bring the gospel from chaos into peace. Merit is going to bring unity within what is going to devolve into chaos. So sorrow can be something fruitful depending on how we deal with it. And that's one of our Lenten considerations. And that's why when St. Paul writes this letter, it apparently makes reference to a third letter to the Corinthians that we do not have a copy of. Because he talks about sending Titus with a letter. And it sounds like the letter was pretty tough. Well, we talked about the divisions within that parish and the difficulty. But it, by this letter that we have today in the quotation, if you read it again, a little bit later in chapter 7, St. Paul refers to some man coming up to him in Corinth. So apparently there was some kind of confrontation at coffee and donuts of some man who was ticked off at the apostle. That's pretty human. We recognize that. And so St. Paul, whatever happened after that, he sends a letter and he sends Titus to go off. And that's what's being talked about in this epistle today. It's great joy when Titus comes back. He's probably thinking at this point, well, Titus, you know, we have this letter, you really have to take it to them because we have to deal with this issue. And he's thinking this poor young man is probably going to be ripped apart limb by limb. And he sends Titus off. But when Titus returns after having delivered this letter and having this letter read to the parish, he comes back and tells them about this tremendous change within this parish at Corinth. And so what St. Paul is doing in this epistle today is he's picking up the original beginning of his second letter to the Corinthians, second because we only have the two. The third one seems to be somewhere in the middle between the two. And in the beginning, he's addressing them, and then he kind of drops in chapter 2 and does what he often does, is go off into a tangent. And then he's talking about the apostolic ministry, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5. And now in chapter 6 and 7, chapter 7 now, he picks up where the greeting in the beginning is starts talking about this return of Titus. That's why this letter starts off by saying, I am so impressed. I am so confident in you now. I have great pride in you. I am filled with encouragement because Titus has told me how you've reacted to this letter. Now, we think the letter was probably pretty naughty, pretty nasty, because that's probably why they destroyed it. Okay, we're good now. Everything's cool in the parish. Get rid of that horrible letter. So we only have two of the three. That's what he's talking about. He's not just all of a sudden becoming exuberant. He's talking about the conversion of the people in Corinth. And so this exuberance that's in this is why he's saying is that the letter that I wrote you, and he says it, it's in verse 8, for even if I saddened you by the letter that I wrote, and he says, I'm sorry that it made you sad, but I don't regret it because it's what you needed. It's what we needed to move forward and unify. And that's why he says, for even if I saddened you by my letter, I do not regret it. For godly sorrow, sorrow in a sense which is blessed by grace, produces a solitary repentance without regret. But worldly sorrow, the sorrow of this world, produces death. And that is what we're living through culturally. We've talked about this. We have, a, we have a culture which is plunging into darkness of despair and depression and suicide and addiction. This didn't happen yesterday. It is a worldly sorrow which comes out of often self-interest, the idea of gain, and the idea of the continual pursuit of pleasure, that everything has to be pleasant. Well, everything's not pleasant. Paying bills isn't pleasant. Keeping the electricity on is great. But paying bills is not pleasant. But the godly sorrow has to deal with the common apostolate of the work of grace, of, the, of virtue, of the common good of the church. And so that's why St. Paul makes a distinction between the two of them. To be sad is in itself neutral. It just means something has bad happened. But what happens within that sadness is a different question. It can be the source of an apostolate and a conversion 
of barbaric peoples. It can be the frustration of chaos breaking out over orthodoxy and theological misunderstanding. Or it can just be self-gain of the individual collapsing into discouragement and ultimately despair. Or it can be finally the hemorrhaging woman who through all this suffering knows that this rabbi has something to offer. And this rabbi can make me whole. And if I just show that confidence and touch even just the very edge of the him, of the fringe of his fa fabric of his cloak, I'll be healed. So during Lent, let us use this third week now coming up to consider within our lives the things that we need to correct, not because we want to be sad, but because we want to be sad so that this thing be corrected, that we move forward, that we don't just simply accept darkness and holes within our lives, that we know that the light and the grace of God is just as healing as it was on the day of the resurrection of our Lord from the dead. And that is the grace that we are seeking so St. Paul says at the end of this letter, your godly sorrow brought about repentance, a change in attitude, a change in mind. And he tells the Corinthians, for behold, what earnestness, what earnestness this godly sorrow has produced in you. What is earnestness? When someone's earnest? Is it really trying hard? Earnestness is this sincere and intense conviction. So that when St. Paul left the Corinthians, they're fighting at coffee and donuts over all kinds of stupid things. I like this priest, I don't like that priest. I like this, I don't like that. By the provocation of a sorrow which was godly, he says now you have a conviction that is sincere and profound and you are now directed on the path of God's gospel. That's why he says, I am proud of you, I am encouraged, and I am overjoyed because of all the afflictions we suffered that makes my joy even now greater. So let us pray that God give us the grace of earnestness, of sincere conviction, and the intensity of a conviction to go forward on the path of light and holiness and to bring great fruit to this season of Lent. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, consistently. Father and the Son, who would be 
Tell what my dev hate a loho, all about a loho, the father can you. When you see what I would talk, you then bite off my spud of high and low, or go to show. Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you. Out of their love for you and for your holy name, shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As we remember our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ, and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering for all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, Saint Mary, and Saint Jude, and Saint Patrick. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Father, God,
God of peace and Lord of security, make us worthy to embrace one another with a sincere kiss in the spirit of your unending love, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let each one of us give a greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith, which is pleasing to the Lord. before you to receive your blessings and assistance for we are weak and you are the support and refuge of all we raise glory to you to your only son and to your holy spirit now and forever Amen. O lord may the light of your face shine upon us deliver us from every evil and blot out all our transgressions that we may raise glory and thanks to you to your only son and to your holy spirit now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit. Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. It is right and just. Truly it is right and just to glorify and exalt you, O maker of all creation. With the angels we glorify you, and with voices of praise we cry out and we proclaim. abundant in mercy because of your love for us you sent your son into the world and he became flesh of the virgin mary for our salvation Wak soya belutal mi tau kado mara sabakhula mehne kulhu o no deni tau bakhro di dakhlo fai kun wakhlo sagi me taqseyo me ti hab khusoyon. Hamro, <laughs> 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 
Baruchu Kodesh, Yabel Talmit Al Kodomara, Sabish Tawa Mehne Kulchun, O no Deni Tao, Demandil Di Antiki Kodato, Dahlo Faipun, Wachlov Sagi, Mete Shadu Meti Hab. He then commanded and instructed them, saying, Each time you celebrate these holy mysteries, you remember my death and resurrection until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord. We profess your resurrection, we await your second coming, we implore your mercy and compassion, we ask for the forgiveness of sins, may your mercy rest upon us. O oh Lord, we remember your coming that saved us, and as we await your second coming, we offer you praise and ask you. On the day when you will judge the righteous and sinners, do not condemn us because of our sins but have compassion and mercy upon us. Turn your face away from our sins and assist us. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father. Have mercy on us. O Lord, as we your sinful children receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we profess our faith in you, and we ask you, have compassion on us, O God, have mercy on us, and hear us. How awesome is this moment, O my beloved, for the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Anin Mario, Anin Mario, Anin Mario, ni temor de rojo chayu kadisho, ona chen alainu al korbo no ho no. By his descent he may make this bread the body of Christ our God. Amen. And make the mixture in this chalice the blood of Christ our God. Amen. May those who share in these holy mysteries be cleansed body and soul from every sin and receive eternal life. O Lord, accept our intercessions and prayers and grant security to your people and peace to your flock. Protect our shepherds, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bashar Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Nusralah Peter, our retired Patriarch, Gregory John, our Bishop. Assist the priests, the deacons, and all those who serve your Holy Church, so that they may intercede and pray to you on our behalf. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord of goodness, your holy church, and have mercy on all her faithful. In your compassion, heal all the wounded and injured among your flock. Punish injustice and strengthen all our brothers and sisters. Bestow the grace of conversion on all. With your indestructible power, strengthen the bishops of the true faith that they may be upright and courageous in their apostolic office. May they show fidelity as they stand ever before your eternal justice. Unto your honor and glory, may they prove themselves upright, dauntless, and persevering in the task confided to them. To lead all the faithful into the fullness of your redeeming light and glory, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, those who have asked us to pray for them, those who desired but were unable to make an offering, and those who assist your holy church. 
Be a shelter and a refuge for them, for you are the Savior of all. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, the civil leaders in our country and throughout the world. Enlighten their consciences to bring security and peace to your people. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the Holy Virgin Mary, Mother of God, and the prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Marin, St. Patrick, and all the saints. Assist us through their prayers and make us worthy of their reward. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the righteous fathers and teachers who have gone to their rest among the saints. Remember those who diligently carried your holy gospel throughout the whole world and confirmed your holy church in the true faith. Assist us through their prayers and strengthen us in your love. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Faithfully remember, O Lord, our parents, brothers, and sisters, teachers, and all the faithful departed here and everywhere who have gone to their rest. Forgive us and forgive them of all sins and offenses. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin. We hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant rest, O God, to the departed, and forgive the sins we have committed, with or without full knowledge. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever, as it was, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. God the Father, you strengthen and encourage us, for we are weak. We implore you to purify us from every sin and to accept our offering, so that in one spirit we may call upon you praying, Our, our Father, who art, art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come. Thy, thy will, will be done, on, on earth as it is in heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. O Lord, lead us not into the trials of temptation that we do not have the strength to overcome, but deliver us from every evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of him, 
and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord, bless your worshipers who bow before you and implore you. Make them worthy of your mercy and forgive their sins, for you are almighty and rich in compassion. We raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit now and forever. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One holy Father, one holy Son, one holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth, to him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory
thank you, O oh Lord, and raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat, and living blood to drink, lover of all people. Have mercy on us. Thank you, O oh Father, for this gift that you have given us, though we are unworthy. Do not shame us because of our sins, but help and save us, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Lord Jesus, stretch forth your right hand and bless your people. Protect them by your holy cross. Be their shelter and refuge and perfect them with your abundant blessings, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your blessed Father and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.